Welcome to the Chapter 20 podcast. Uh, during this first one, I'm going to focus on a lot of the DNA technology. And so you can see here we have a glowing hydra. So this is a type of jellyfish typically found in fresh water. Uh, and this one has a natural gene that makes it glow. And you'll see the significance of this. We've talked about mice and, and cats and monkeys and all the stuff that we've made glow. And many, if not all of those, have been using this gene that really doesn't make you glow, but it makes you fluoresce. It makes you look like you're glowing. Uh, under fluorescent light, or essentially a black light. And so in this case, you can see an example of where the gene comes from, but we're going to talk about some of these problems of what do you do when the gene that you want is not in the type of organism that you want it to be in. And so that's kind of more the focus on today's lecture, is how we apply our understanding of, of DNA and genetics to actually accomplish stuff. And so the first thing I want to do is make you guys realize just how recent most of this stuff with uh, really DNA in our lives has been. And it was the early 90s that you started to see people use DNA testing to be part of law enforcement, to be part of paternity tests. You know, it got cheap enough to do it. We had the technology to do it. So during the O.J. Simpson case, it was partly a major case because they had to explain to people how DNA testing, how DNA evidence worked because people was unheard of. You know, people could use blood types to try to figure out that maybe you were there. But the idea that you could say that the odds are like 6 billion to 1, when there's only 6 billion people on this planet, so realistically it's you, maybe two guys on this planet whose blood that could belong to, that type of specificity was just unheard of. You know, to sit there and say that your chance of getting struck by lightning is 1 in a couple million, but yet your odds of this blood not being yours at the crime scene is so much beyond there, it's in the billions, that was new for people. And so this idea of DNA technology in our everyday lives has really been around for, at this point, you could say about 20 years. And so your parents certainly, you know, I certainly went through this, you guys not so much. We weren't growing up where they would just have crime shows where they swab some DNA and then just went, oh, put this in the crime lab and tell me who did it. You know, back then you'd have to try to find fingerprints, blood typing, a whole bunch of other evidence that tended to be much harder to deal with. Whereas nowadays we're used to the ubiquitous DNA testing that let us uh, determine all kinds of things relatively simply, but that wasn't always. Now, part of what I want you guys to realize is what's the reason we want to do this? You know, what's the, the, the impetus for us to do all of this DNA technology stuff? Why are we trying to mess with things? And so our question as scientists is what are we supposed to do with people like amputees that are missing limbs? Is it acceptable for us to try to build better and better prosthetics and to try to want to wire those things in into like their nervous system so they can be better and better controlled and we can eventually be all Luke Skywalker on this? You know, people with genetic disorders, should we try and fix them? If we have the ability to essentially remove a gene and replace it with a healthy gene, is that something that's worthwhile? If you have organ failure, whether it's from cancer, whether it's because you had some type of disease that you caught, but if you have where an organ is failing, what should we do about that? Do we just let the people die? Do we just rely on organ transplants? Or is it okay to try to be more proactive and try to figure out if there's ways that we can either synthetically like build an artificial heart, or if there's some way we can use things like stem cells and program them to try and grow you a new heart? Are these acceptable things? And these are a lot of the problems that people are dealing with as they look at biotechnology, which includes genetic engineering, kind of how we mess with stuff genetically. We also have increasing population size in humans. You know, right now we're about 7 billion. Depending on exactly how this trajectory goes, we're probably by 2050, I think they say about 9 billion. So we have more and more mouths to feed. But we're not having more and more land that we can use to grow crops on typically. Some of the land that we're growing it on is becoming less and less productive. You know, we're using up a lot of the nutrients there. And so we have to figure out how is it that we can cope with the fact that we have to provide more and more food year after year for a growing population. And then what do you do if the environment's screwing with you, if you will, where you have uh, or, like soil that's becoming more salty and so that can make it where it's harder to grow crops. We've talked about this idea of nutrient depletion. Uh, you can have varying weather conditions as things get warmer, colder, wetter, drier. And so how do we kind of work around some of these things and still meet the needs that we have, both medically and agriculturally? And so these are the things that are kind of in the back of most scientists' minds when they're doing this research, trying to move along our knowledge and move along the ways in which we can apply 
genetic technology. So don't assume that they're all in labs trying to just, you know, brew up monkeys with four butts. We are trying to ultimately come up with practical solutions for everyday problems that we're encountering. And so one of the ways that they can try to deal with this is if we have problems that we can't fix by selective breeding, if no one in that species possesses a trait that we need that lets them be more tolerant towards, it could be like insects, you know, part of nature. Insects come through, eat a bunch of your crops, you have less food then to feed to people. So what if you have a gene that's in some other organism that wards off insects? Is it acceptable then to go through what we call recombination? We've talked about this with crossing over, but we can also do this across species to link two different sources of DNA. So we can take a gene that's useful from one species and put it in another to try and then make a new, it's not really a full hybrid, but a new transgenic organism is what we'd call it, a mix of two different species DNA, uh, that's capable of thriving better and providing us with more resources. So our goal here would be more food for people. And so this falls under genetic engineering though, which is basically when we m manipulate or mess with the genes of things. So typically we're adding or subtracting genes. Uh, in some cases, if there's a negative gene, you might want to break it, sabotage it, remove it. In some cases, we want to add this positive gene like golden rice, where rice doesn't naturally produce high levels of vitamin A. So we can add a gene that does, so that way all these people that eat rice as their normal food and are deficient in vitamin A, get their vitamin A. You know, we're trying to not just focus on food there, we're focusing on nutrition. And genetic engineering, transgenics, all of this stuff falls under biotechnology, which is really just a broad term for us manipulating organisms in general to help out something, you know, to help us out uh, with our quality of life, uh, with the organism itself's longevity perhaps, but we're doing it for some purpose. And this could be including things like prosthetics and artificial hearts, things like that. It's not purely confined to genetics. That's one big chunk of biotechnology. But biotechnologists do lots of other things that you guys will see uh, in hospitals as they work to build better machinery. You know, you've got heart bypass machines that can act like your heart and your lung. You've got dialysis. There's lots of things that fall into that that are not purely genetic. So we're going to focus mostly on the genetic idea, but I will occasionally bring up the biotechnology broad idea because that's what's driving why we're doing this. And I want to make sure you guys appreciate that scientists aren't doing this just for their own benefit. They're doing this because they're trying to solve a problem that we have in the real world. Now, if we want to go through and get that gene, so let's say we've got this gene in jellyfish that makes you fluoresce. And so we want to grab that gene, then that's our gene of interest. What we'll do is we will then find out where the gene of interest is on the DNA or on a chromosome. We'll then sequence it. And then based upon the specific gene sequence, we will use what's called restriction enzymes, which cut DNA at specific sequences. So whenever they see that particular sequence that they cut at, they'll slice the DNA up. And so if we can cut this gene on either side, so essentially excising this gene out, we can then take that gene copy it a bunch using PCR, which we'll discuss later, and then we can insert that gene into a plasmid that's been cut by the same restriction enzyme. This is important it's cut by the same restriction enzyme because whenever restriction enzymes cut things, they tend to leave what are called sticky ends. You'll see here that when it cuts it, it leaves these little single-stranded pieces. And these single-stranded pieces have specific nucleotide sequences based upon which restriction enzyme cut them. So in this case, this restriction enzyme cuts at GAATTC. But when it cuts, it leaves this AATT exposed. So anything else I cut with that same restriction enzyme can kind of stick or Velcro to the ends. They can come back together. And so I add a little bit of ligase in that mix, and they will adhere and make one full, complete piece. So if I cut a plasmid with that restriction enzyme to kind of break it up, and I cut this gene out with that restriction enzyme, I can kind of paste the two together add some ligase and get a full complete plasmid piece of DNA here uh, that ultimately contains my gene of interest and anything else I decide to stick in there. You know, it's possible you can put other genes as well. And so this will be the general process for trying to get a gene that we need into what we'll call a vector, which is how we're going to transport that gene into a cell. And vectors most commonly that, that we'll talk about will be plasmids, these small rings of DNA, which we can then try to get into a cell so that cell can express it, so we can add a gene to that cell. So this process of gene or DNA cloning, just to make sure we're comfortable, 
it, it, the critical piece in large part is going to be these restriction enzymes. Because if we know where we're going to cut the DNA, that's what allows us to make sure that we A, can cut the plasmid once. We don't want to cut it a bunch of times and disintegrate it. We just want to open it up and that we can cut the gene on either side of the gene we're trying to add into the plasmid with the same restriction enzyme. So when we do so, these sticky ends will then be able to go together and allow us to li go through and do ligase, add ligase to seal it up. Now some of them will cut it and give us what we call blunt ends, so those are less useful to us because they cut it and they don't leave these sticky ends, so it's harder for us to get the pieces to adhere back together. You know, if you have separate pieces of Velcro but there's no overhang, it's very difficult to get those separate Velcro pieces to stick together. And so when we do stuff, we tend to focus on ones that give us these sticky ends if we're trying to insert it in things. All right, so before we move on, I just want to make it clear that there's going to be a variety of different restriction enzymes, a lot of them. And each of them are going to have their own sequence that they're looking for, such as GAA, TTC. And that specific sequence that works for them to cut is going to be called the restriction site. And so based upon where we want to cut something, we have to find the restriction enzyme that will cut it at the specific sequence that we need, that restriction site. Now once it cuts this, we're going to end up with pieces in many cases. And so these pieces, just keep in mind, will be called restriction fragments. That will be important a little bit later because one of our technologies will be called restriction fragment length polymorphisms. So the restriction, frag the restriction fragment idea is just the pieces that are left over after you've gone through these very specific scissors, if you will, uh, these restriction enzymes to cut up the DNA that we're looking at. Now, once we've gone through and done this, the whole purpose is that if we find the gene that we want and we cut it out with that restriction enzyme, so that's what's going on here, this is going to be our gene of interest. It's going to be cut out from this guy, and then we're going to make copies of it, so we've got plenty. We're then going to cut the plasmid at a specific site, the restriction site, uh, with the same type of restriction enzyme, which will allow us to patch the two together to insert the gene of interest and use DNA ligase to seal it up. So we now have a plasmid that will typically contain our gene of interest, so G of I, if you will, as I make crap up. And we're also going to have usually a marker gene as well. And we'll talk more about that. That's the idea of fluorescing or antibiotic resistance. So we'll have some other gene usually in here. It's not just the one gene. Once we've gotten this set, we're going to want to, because we've got our cloning vector now is what this is called. So our cloning vector is usually a plasmid. Uh, and you'll see in some cases for eukaryotes, we'll use something called a yeast artificial chromosome. So it's very similar. It's just usually not circular. It'll be linear. Uh, but regardless, we've got like our small piece of DNA that we then have to get into the cell to make things work. So that's the last step here, where if it's bacteria, we can just kind of put them together and say, there you go, because bacteria are kind of oddballs. We've already talked about conjugation or transformation, that these guys are really free and loose with their DNA. You know, they're that kid that sits down and notices gum below their desk, and then you turn around and they're chewing gum. And you're just like, whoa. That's kind of how bacteria roll. Now, for eukaryotes, we'll oftentimes have to give them a little shock to their systems to make things work. And we literally call that shock to their system electroporation because I meant it as a literal shock to the cell. It tends to make their membrane a little bit more porous, which allows for our vector to slide in. Now, in some cases, we can get around this whole transformation electroporation by using a virus, uh, especially if we're talking about gene therapy which is where you're trying to fix a gene after the fact. You know, a lot of the stuff we're talking about here, where we get our vector, we get our gene of interest, we get them together, we insert it in a cell, we go through and make copies of everything, then we're going to use that marker gene we talked about, such as antibiotic resistance or fluorescing under UV light, and we're going to use that to separate out who has the gene of interest and who doesn't, because it's a package deal. You know, if you fluoresce, you got the gene of interest too. If you survive on antibiotics, you have the gene of interest too. So it makes it easy for us to get rid of the other guys and then just reproduce the ones that have what we're looking for. So within this process, this normally is going to occur when we're trying to fix essentially a zygote. Or if it's something asexual, we're just trying to fix a cell. You know, you can fix one bacteria cell and make a whole bunch of them. But if you're already a person that has a genetic disorder, it's much more difficult because I can't just fix one of your cells, I have to fix all of your cells. And so that's why sometimes for those they'll use viruses, but these viruses which were meant to not be harmful ended up killing a kid in an early trial that was like 19 years old, 
and so it's kind of stalled out. So right now we have some gene therapy being done, but it's much more reserved because people thought, oh, you know, this virus is kind of like vaccine where we've messed it up enough, it shouldn't infect you until it did, and then they're like, oh, well, well, we'll cool off on this for a little bit. So there still is a lot of interest in trying to do some of the viral vectors to try and kind of fix people through gene therapy once they have the disorder, because it's much more costly uh, in terms of when you're just having children to go through intra uh, in vitro fertilization, to go through this whole selective process of genetic testing, that's not available to most people. Most people that have uh, some type of, I don't want to say like bad gene because I don't want to say they're bad people, but someone who has a genetic disease or disorder, they are ultimately going to already have it. You know, we can't fix it except for after the fact and the viruses work well for that, or at least theoretically work well for that. So this is just the general overview then of how we do stuff. And so this is just showing an example. So we cut out this red guy, which would be our gene of interest. You'll also see these blue guys. These would be like our marker genes. Uh, and so they'll be there to help us figure out who's who. So in this case, because it's bacteria, they're going to code for antibiotic resistance. So we mix these plasmids and bacteria together. Some of these guys will be transformed. They'll grab this plasmid. Now this will be a small number, actually. This is going to be, you know, in the single digits of percentages. This is not the norm. And then we're going to try to grow it on antibiotics. And the guys that took the plasmid and used it, they survive. These guys that did not will die when grown on the antibiotic. So this is our way of selecting for just the guys that have the gene of interest. Now this picture is not entirely accurate because there should be like, you know, a thousand guys dead and four guys that made it. But then once we get these four guys that make it, we can keep putting them on nutrient broth or uh, agar plates, gel plates, and we can keep growing and growing and growing them until we get huge quantities, huge colonies of these, each of which can be producing what we're after which in the case of bacteria could be something like insulin, it could be something like human growth hormone, and then once they produce it and secrete it, we can isolate that from their secretions and use it for something like medicine. If this was fluorescing, it'd be the exact same idea on the whole. Insert the DNA one way or another, figure out who has it by taking a UV light and going all CSI on it and seeing who fluoresces. And the ones that fluoresce, those are the ones that you breed. The ones that don't, those are the ones that become pets or food or whatever it is depending on this particular animal involved. So this is pretty much going to wrap up our talk about general gene cloning and just how that works. So we're going to pick up in the next one as we talk about some more technologies that deal with making copies and identifying stuff within our actual genomes, within our DNA. So I'll talk to you guys soon.